The world is a beautiful but challenging place to live. And let's face it, life hits hard sometimes. So if you find your hopes and dreams and mental well-being needs a boost, you're tuned in to the right podcast. Welcome to Inspire Us with your host, Jay Paul Nadeau, a former hostage negotiator turned motivational speaker and acclaimed author of Take Control of Your Life. And now, here's your host, Jay Paul Nadeau. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inspire Us. Today, we are going to talk about inclusion. We're going to talk about people with disabilities. I am talking to a guest who has had her share of setbacks, but that has never kept her from moving forward and from believing in herself. She had to change her inner narrative. She was discriminated against for a number of reasons, including visual impairment. Now, she says that simple acts of kindness to one another makes such a big difference, and it does. So, without any further delay, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Ingrid Palmer. Hello, Ingrid, and welcome to Inspire Us. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you on. I was reading your incredible story and your mission, and it really resonated on so many levels with me because you are, you've come from a very difficult past with many challenges, and yet you have thrown yourself 1,050% into helping others uh, to get by the struggles that you went through. And I would love for you to share your story with our audience because it, it is so inspiring. Thank you so much. You know, I've been fighting systems and barriers, uh, like you said, my whole life. Um, I went into foster care uh, when I was in grade seven after being um, sexually molested. And I was diagnosed in my teens, about a year after I went into care, I was diagnosed with a rare disorder called retinitis pigmentosa. And it's a visual disorder where the UVA and UVB rays of the sun are like acid on my retinas. And so I've been basically slowly going blind my whole life. My retinas have been constantly uh, dissolving. I lack depth perception. So the world is very flat for me. I have a very hard time recognizing faces because, you know, faces are so 3D. I have always had tunnel vision. So my view, my perception is a lot smaller than everyone else's. I don't see as much top and bottom or to the sides as everybody else does. And it also includes um, night blindness, which means that my eyes, my pupils don't open or constrict the same way in different uh, lighting as others do. And so uh, navigating has always been extremely difficult for me, but not being diagnosed until I was 14. And because I did have vision and always said, yes, I can see when asked, I was generally perceived as being uh, somebody who wanted attention, an attention seeker, and just deliberately acting silly, bumping into things or claiming that I couldn't see things that were right in front of me. And that was the reputation I had, which was very difficult for me because I knew that I wasn't pretending, but I didn't have any explanation as to my difficulties because I got glasses when I was around eight years old, but all those problems persisted. Me walking into things, me knocking things over, me claiming that um, I couldn't see things that people said I was looking right at and uh, not being able to recognize people. And then when I was 16 years old, I was further diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome. So that's two rare disorders for me, not the type of jackpot I wanted to win. Uh, but that's another condition that affects only about 10% of women. And it's a, it's a hormone imbalance uh, where we have um, you know, an overproduction of testosterone. And one of the side conditions of polycystic ovary syndrome is another condition called hirsutism. And so I grow a beard. I have always chosen to shave my beard. But uh, as a youngster, I, you know, and as a female, I didn't know how to shave properly. I was using razor blades for about three, four days in a row. My skin was very inflamed. I had razor bumps and the skin really darkened along the sides of my face, my cheeks and my chin. And so I thereby had this 
dark tattoo of the very feature I was desperate to hide. So even though I shaved, you could still see this shadow. And the way I was treated in public was, it was so hard for a, a large portion of my life. I dreaded going outside. I would have to steal myself and fortify my soul and my mind, knowing the possible things that I could encounter uh, when I went out. Besides just having people give me really dirty looks or shy away from me, not wanting to sit beside me in public transit, I'd be refused service at times. And you can imagine being visually impaired and that my eyesight, as I said, was continuously deteriorating. Every year I saw less than I did the year before. And, and in navigating the world, sometimes I needed help. And I remember times asking people, because I wanted to say, hey, I'm looking for this number. Can you possibly direct me? And I'd get, before I could even get the whole sentence out, I'd get, you know, don't talk to me, you know, get away from me. Um, and that was because of people's perceptions of my sexuality and the homophobic world that I was growing up in. Um, it was really, really difficult to do anything. And just having experiencing daily all these different layers of discrimination and stigma, whether it was based on, um, you know, being a Black person, whether it was being a female, whether it was because people found out I was in care and the perception that they have of youth in care as being a delinquent and of being no good, or whether it was because of uh, people's perception of um, my sexuality and, and being often perceived as a trans woman. Um, there were just all these layers that I constantly had to navigate through and levels of stigma and discrimination that, you know, really weighed heavily on me. And especially as a youngster, as a teenager, and as a young adult, um, was really difficult uh, to navigate through. But um, I always decided that I, there was just this thing inside of me that was always pushing back, always saying, you know, that I'm not going to let you determine who I am and what I'm capable of and what I'm going to become. So I was always like fighting. But in order to do that, in order to survive all these things, it's like I, I also at that time really had to toughen myself up. So I really kind of dimmed down the soft sides of me because I was constantly having to put on this armor to deflect this constant wave of negativity that was always coming back at me. But I found that also began to really impact my ability to have really warm and sensitive and loving relationships with people, whether those were friendships or otherwise, because this other side of me was always battling. And, and it was really hard to know when I could take off this armor and be safe and when I had to keep it on in order to protect myself. So it took some, some years for me to get to this place of acceptance when I realized that, you know, my strength lay in accepting all of me fully and not even feeling the need to have the fight. I always saw the fight as being outside of me and being society. And there came a time when I realized that the real fight was actually inside of me because I didn't actually have to fight them once I accepted myself fully for who I was, that I could take off that armor and relax and just be me and, you know, let the negative people be their negative selves, um, but that I could be myself and love myself and I would attract those type of wonderful people who would also see the goodness in me. Um, so wow. that's promote I now yeah, for people to, hey, just love yourself and it'll all fall in place. You don't have uh, to. Yeah, no, no, no. You sorry. I, am. I, I cut you off there, but I really apologize. I just wanted to say, wow, what a discovery you made. The fight was inside of you, you said. Yeah. And you, you answered the question that I was going to ask, because I was going to ask, was there a time where you, you turned that all around? And you did. Uh, it, I guess it was that self-talk, that narrative that you had, uh, the one that that consumed you at first, uh, feeling bad, but then you changed that. What was it that, that finally got you to turn it around and say, hey, listen, the fight is inside of me. It's not out here. The fight is inside me. Once I accept myself, once I love myself, then my life gets better. What was it that, that brought you there? Was it just the constant struggles? I think it was in my downtime, like when I was by myself and feeling safe, like, you know, I'm a really reflective 
person just by nature. And so, you know, you would go over the things that you experience and the, you know, things that people say to you, like kind of echo in your ears. But I would find that deep down inside myself, even though outwardly I was negating the things that people were saying to me, I knew deep down inside that I had internalized those things and a part of me had believed them too. And that that was the bigger problem. Um, and that if I could change my internal chatter that was actually, um, you know, repeating what I was hearing, repeating what I was saying, that that would change everything. So changing those limiting beliefs and those limiting thoughts and, and just rearranging those sentences. So those thoughts that were saying that you aren't good enough, you know, you aren't worthy of this and saying, oh, yes, I am. I do deserve this. I work hard. I'm going to have, you know, everything that I want in life. I'm deserving of good people in my life. I'm deserving of a good job and that having a disability or being visually impaired doesn't make me capable, um, you know, because pushing hard through school, I graduated with honors from high school, with honors from college, with a, you know, a GPA over 4.0 from university and couldn't get a job to save my life. Why? Because employers were so afraid of visual impairment, they would rather I be physically disabled than be blind. And that was something that I didn't discover until I was looking for a job. And so I was unemployed for many years because of that, that stigma in society um, that people couldn't believe that you could be a visually impaired person and still be capable of holding a job and doing um, work. And so it actually took um, my children's um, school principal, oddly enough. Um, I had been asked many times over the years, I have three children, but my eldest child, there's a gap of about 13 years there between her and my middle child. And that goes back to the polycystic ovaries and you know the difficulty that we women have who have that condition in bearing children. But needless to say, um, I've been asked many times over the years to participate in school council. And I always said, well, it's a little bit difficult for me because the council meetings are held at night and it's hard for me to navigate. I mean, my husband had a job that didn't have set hours, so I couldn't rely on him to bring me. And the answer that I would get was always, oh, well, that's too bad. But this one principal said, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to give you a taxi chit to make sure that you can go and come. And I was like, what? And that simple act of closing that one little accessibility gap allowed me like to um, be voted in a school council chair, a visually impaired woman was school council chair for two years. And what that did for me was reignite my passion for service and for doing and reminded me that I am capable, that although for over 10 years, society had said to me, you can't do anything. You're blind. We can't rely on you. You're not capable. And that over the years of not being able to find employment that I had, you know, in some ways internalized this, but this opportunity that now came ahead of me to put on events in the school, to run that, to lead a, a, a volunteer group of parents and putting on all these different functions at school and using my creativity and ensuring that all the special needs kids at that school were included in everything that just showed me again that you know what you can do stuff you are brilliant <laughs> <laughs> oh Ingrid I love what you're saying I'm just listening I got goosebumps just listening to you um you talked about so many things that are so important that people tend to forget those affirmations that you were telling yourself you know like I I am deserving I am worthy all those affirmations People don't use them enough. And when you do use them, you tend to believe them the more you say them, right? And then what you know, to turn around and to do the things that you were doing, that one break, that principle that gave you that one break by providing you with transportation really opened so many doors for you. And look what you've done since then. Like yeah. you're, you're, you're now a diversity and inclusion consultant, a program co a coordinator. Uh, you're also a founder and a CEO of Focus on Ability. Uh, you, today you champion uh, for marginalized voices by using your impactful narratives to break down barriers and connect people on a deeper level. Wow, how did that all come about other than, was it working with the kids that brought all these other things about? It came about like what I was saying with, with that, that ability to become school council chair. So when that 
happened. I also that same year got voted in to be chair of another council. And that was called the Parent Academy. And what that was, was a group of about 22 parents that represented different school councils in the same area. We would come together and um, we put on like self-development activities like for ourselves, or we'd share best practices of different things that we were doing in our schools that maybe the other schools would be interested in. And I became co-chair of that committee. And then my principal said to me, you know what? I bet you'd be really good at, you know, the inner city advisory committee, which was up at the board level at the Toronto District School Board. So I got, I ended up being voted in as chair of that. So for two years, <laughs> I was chairing three different committees. And um, after the first two finished, because they had a two-year limit, I actually continued to co-chair the Inner City Advisory Committee. I just resigned in January of this year, so for about seven years. And that committee is concerned with closing gaps of our you know, marginalized students in, in all of our TDSB schools. And then I just started getting involved in all the other intersections in my life. So I lived in Toronto Community Housing. I started to serve on a committee there that was began by John Tory to revamp Toronto Community Housing. So I was serving with um, City of Toronto staff and other residents from Toronto Community Housing. And we were called, um, uh, I forget what we were called right now. It's gone out of my head. But uh, are the point was for us to to work together to revamp uh, Toronto community housing, and then that spread into you know I was came from foster care, and so I've always been involved. So now I'm the board chair of the Child Welfare Political Action Committee, and we are, are looking for change at the legislative level, and we've also been very instrumental in getting free. Um, tuition for all former youth in care from I think it's about seven uh, colleges and universities across Canada at this point and we're going after all of them and you know also working with um, disability grassroots disability groups to get our narratives out there um, there are so many different types of marginalization that goes on um, where people are pushed out to the edges and forgotten about and and we deserve a place in society everybody wants to belong everybody deserves to belong. And that's what I'm about is championing the voices of everybody who's been pushed off to the side, who's been silenced and saying, no way. I everybody love, I love that. Sorry, sorry, I, I'm gonna let you talk some more because I just love what you're saying. You're absolutely right. Everybody deserves a place in society. And what you're doing and what the people working with you are doing is that they are working on, on improving accessibility and inclusion. Mm -hmm. what, what, what would it be, what would you like to tell people, uh, the general public who are going to be listening to this, our, our audience are gonna be listening to you, what would you like them to know uh, about uh, inclusion and accessibility? If you could give a message out to people, what would it be? It would be that just to know that a win for one is a win for everybody. And I think that's something that we don't realize. Sometimes we have in society this thought of like, why should I help? Or why does it matter? It doesn't impact me. But it really does. Because when we help another person, when we ensure that, um, that other individuals are included, we don't always realize the um, reciprocal benefit that's generated, that it really does do something to you too, um, that it grows you um, as a person, and that the society that we build, that we cultivate out of that is absolutely, there's no deficit, there's no downside to um, making sure that everybody is able to participate in every facet of our lives, and that actually when we make our society and our world accessible and beneficial uh, for those who are experiencing disadvantage, that it actually helps everybody. It's like when we, we revamped the sidewalks for persons with disabilities and wheelchairs and we made that, you know, that one section that was leveled to the road so that they could get up easier. That benefited women mothers with strollers it benefited seniors with their walkers like it benefited everybody even though because we made that little accessibility curve for one particular group so when we help those that are most affected and most disadvantaged it benefits us all that is absolutely true and absolutely beautiful you're so right 
And if only we work together to include everyone, wouldn't the world be a better place, such a better place? And everything that you've talked about, your whole background, uh, the things that have happened to you, what is so beautiful and remarkable about your story is that you never gave up. And that not only when you found your voice, when you realized that the fight was inside of you and that you had to challenge yourself to change your mindset, look at all the great things that you've come to accomplish. And by providing people with opportunities, can you imagine if we provided everyone with disabilities the opportunities to, to grow and to exchange and to share? I think it's absolutely lovely. What are you doing now? Is there anything that you're working on specifically now that you would like to, us to know about? Well, right now I am working um, with the Institute for Research and Inclusion in Society on a major project, which is bringing together all federally regulated um, entities and the disability community so that we can ensure that all those entities are accessible uh, for persons with disabilities. And that's going to be a huge deal because there are so many persons with disabilities who have amazing talents and, and, and gifts and thoughts that um, they could give to improve society that are going largely unaccessed. And, and a lot of people, you know, these days and, and companies are, are really interested. They really do want to become better stewards of inclusion, but they're trying to do it on their own. And so they're constantly missing things. So when we bring those two sides together and we're getting input from the very people that are impacted, then that goes a long way to ensuring that, that you get things right. And that's something that we're getting better at society is actually including the people people that things are being made for <laughs> because a lot of times things are misjudged uh, because you don't have the correct perspective you need the people who are being impacted to be involved in the designing and in the planning so that you get things right so that you really put the money where it's best needed is we've seen in the past where a lot of money is put forward on projects and then they fall flat because they just weren't adequately prepared or the focus was really on the wrong part of it. And so I'm really proud to be involved in bringing uh, the disabled community in contact with these federally regulated entities that are being required by law to be as accessible as possible to make sure that that the right priorities are being focused on and that the outcome will be the best that it can be because there is such a well-rounded involvement. So well said, so well said, and you're right. We, if we all work together and we include the people who are suffering from the disabilities, we accomplish so much more because we get their input. And I love the way that you said that. There's a couple of things I want to, um, I want to touch on. And, uh, I love two quotes that you've given, and one of them is, when you dig deep into your challenges, you mind the very ingredients necessary to overcome them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with that? Was that something that, uh, that just came to you one day or... or that's definitely from my experiences. And I, I and when I when I give talks, I, I really do talk about how, you know, the very situations that seemed like they were going to bury me really became the building blocks to the future I have now. Because when we are going through really difficult situations and adversity and just real challenges to our spirit and to our minds and we feel really overwhelmed, it's really incredible to realize that that very situation though, that same situation holds within it the very ingredients need to overcome it, to that when we're going through these difficult situations, the opportunity is always there to develop in some way, to become stronger, to gain perspective, to grow strength in a way um, that we really didn't have before. And so it, it can really be empowering in itself to find those areas of growth within that very situation that's just tearing you apart. But it, it does exist um, in every situation. So we can choose to let whatever we are going through really tear us apart and, and cripple us and, and cause us to, you know, shut ourselves away. Or we can say, you know what, I'm going to use this very thing to grow deeper, to become more empathetic, to 
to gain strength, to be a role model for myself and for others. We really can find in that exact same situation the seeds to grow ourselves and develop ourselves and come back even better and stronger than we were before the situation arose. I mean, you're so right. It comes down to choice now, right? It comes down to choice. Another quote that you gave was, uh, when you dig deep into your vulnerabilities, you mine the seeds necessary to grow your strength. And that's it exactly. You know, sometimes we are so afraid to admit and to show our vulnerabilities. It feels scary. It, you know, it, it feels really uncomfortable. And sometimes it feels really weak to say and to admit those feelings that we have of vulnerability, of feeling incapable, of feeling afraid. But the the beautiful thing is that whenever we are able to do that and when we're able to show that to others, that it connects us. That when you think that you're going to find ridicule, when you think that you are going to find hate and negativity, in those moments when you let your vulnerability show, you are always met with love you are always met with care and with understanding and it's really wonderful to see as a society and and on a a humanitarian level how we really come together and rally around each other when vulnerability raises its head and so it's a lesson for us all to know that um, we don't have to be afraid of, of showing our vulnerabilities and that we we connect very deeply along those lines, actually. I so believe that too. I believe that vulnerability is a gateway to love, understanding, and connection. So you and I talk the same language when you talk that, and so many things that you said resonated with me. So I can see why you are an award-winning inspirational speaker. You're an author certified in group facilitation, diversity, and inclusion. So many things. And you have shared such great information with us. And I thank you so much for coming on. How can people get a hold of you if they want to talk to you further, if they want you as a speaker or just to get your insight? Well, I am. I do have uh, Instagram, uh, Focus on Ability Life. My website is www.focusonability.life. And I am on Facebook and LinkedIn as Ingrid Palmer. And you can definitely message me. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Ingrid, I got to say that I still have goosebumps from the things that you've told me. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing what you did. And also, I applaud your strength. I applaud everything that you're doing to making this world a better place for those who are struggling and who may feel left out. What you're doing is absolutely beautiful, and I wish every success to you, and it's been an honor to meet you today and to speak with you today. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have been on your podcast, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another insightful episode. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and leave your comments. For more information, check out our website at www.inspireus.ca. Remember, it's not what happens to us that matters most. It's how we respond to what happens to us that does. Stay strong and resilient.